Hi everyone, um, welcome back. Um, so we have Simon Nelson um, is going to give a keynote for the next 15 minutes. Um, Simon um, is a leader in online education, but um, is one of those deep digital guys who's been around for too many years. He wouldn't thank me for saying how long he's been around, but his team created the iPlayer, um, started off as a, as, a, as a radio product. Um, and then um, he went on to do other wonderful things at the BBC before um, being asked by the Open University to, to start up a new online platform called FutureLearn, which has turned into one of the biggest, the world's biggest, um, and he's now um, just gone on to green pastures at Nord Anglia. Over to you, Simon, who's going to be talking about the state of the art in online education. Many thanks, Rick. Um, so uh, let me uh, try to share this. Um, and bear with me. Okay, Rick, are you, uh, can you confirm you're seeing that for me? Or Lisa or someone? I'm actually, it's all shifted to the side. Um, I'm... Okay, bear with me, sorry. Um, I'm seeing, yeah, maybe there's two, two screens. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is, um, I will do this. Um, means you lose a little bit of my. Uh... So uh, presumably you're seeing my screen that's there, fine. are you? Yeah. yeah, that's fine. Thanks. All right. So we'll uh, we'll do that. Okay. Uh, yeah. So thanks for the kind intro, Rick. Um, Simon Nelson. Um, and uh, for the last eight years or so, I've been chief executive of uh, FutureLearn a company. Uh, as Rick said, I set up with investment from. British Open University uh, back in 2012 as the UK entrant to the world of MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. Um, and uh, I'll say a bit more about FutureLearn coming up. But um, prior to that, and when Rick and I met, uh, yeah, I was at the BBC for nearly 15 years, um, setting, up, setting up and running the uh, digital operations first for the radio part of the BBC and then for the TV part of the BBC. And it was there that I started to um, uh, move beyond my love of games as a consumer into uh, being able to work with some creators. And Rick was the catalyst for this. Um, and we both had a lot of fun creating the um, Doctor Who adventure games, uh, working with um, uh, people, uh, you know, a world-class array of talent, including uh, Sumo Digital uh, from Sheffield, are they, or Leeds? Um, and uh, who I saw on the panel later and were fantastic to work with. Uh, and a guy called Charles Cecil, who was the uh, author and originator of the Broken Sword uh, series. Uh, and it gave us a chance to kind of bring back the Daleks and blow up Trafalgar Square and put the Doctor um, and his companion into uh, all sorts of weird and wonderful places. Gave you a chance to fly the TARDIS even. So um, yeah, had a lot of uh, fun with that. Um, I, actually, in my history, I'm going to go back. I never normally do this, but I'm going to go back as far as um, when I was a student because I was a classicist studying ancient Greek and Latin. And the only reason I bring that up is because I'm talking to a games audience. And I just wanted to point to this thing. Um, now, obviously, I'm way behind the curve because Assassin's Creed Valhalla is now what everyone's talking about. But over Christmas, I got COVID. Um, and... Uh, I, it was, you know, pretty nasty, but none of the worst symptoms. Um, and I was kind of, uh, stuck on my sofa. TV wasn't doing it for me. Reading certainly wasn't. And so, uh, the kids let me, um, get back on the PlayStation with this game they'd bought me. And I'm talking here about the edu education, new forms of education. And I have just been staggered by, the landscape that uh, Ubisoft have created in this extraordinary game. Um, and I think back to uh, the lecturers, the professors who taught me at university, who could only in their minds imagine ancient Athens or ancient Corinth or ancient Mycenae um, and, um, and would try to describe with words and in books 
um, the landscape that we might have uh, uh, experienced in the periods we were studying in such depth. It is an astonishing piece of work that is done by these developers and just you know, really brings to life for me now as a consumer, rediscovering it, just the still, I think, enormously untapped potential of gaming um, and um, the principles of games uh, in education. There's amazing stuff happening, but we're barely scratching the surface. So um, um, I've now joined uh, a company called Nord Anglia Education, which is the largest education, uh, private education group in the world. Uh, so they have uh, actually uh, now 73 schools. They've just made some acquisitions in their 30th country, which is the UK. Before that, they were all international. Um, and uh, it's an amazing kind of uh, test bed for uh, innovative, groundbreaking uh, education products. And that's why they've brought me in to try and uh, see if we can do something using this uh, an, uh, sort of unique environment to... Um, uh, to try out new approaches with digital education. And of course, there's never been a better time to do that because we're coming out of a pandemic uh, that has uh, you know, completely accelerated the adoption curve for ed tech. So you'll, you'll have seen um, versions of this maybe in other uh, presentations, but um, you know, the prediction is that the traditional adoption life cycle for uh, ed tech uh, in the education industry has just been massively accelerated by uh, the pandemic. And certainly at FutureLearn, we experienced that five times growth in all our metrics this time last year as the world went into lockdown uh, and new digital approaches to teaching uh, school children, uh, university kids and training and retraining people for existing jobs or new jobs um, that would emerge from the uh, post-pandemic world became massively accelerated. Um, so it, it's an incredible opportunity for schools, uh, we believe, um, but that doesn't mean um, just more uh, devices and screen time because if the pandemic's shown anything, it's actually the value of the school itself uh, and the teachers within that school. Uh, the school as a social environment, um, as uh, a place for the personal as well as educational development of our children, um, and the teacher as a guide, mentor, inspiration within that environment, not purely a teacher. So what we're trying to think through is how we can take the best of what we've learned during the pandemic um, and bring it back into the classroom and into the hands of teachers rather than trying to you know, re replace the teacher with robots or algorithms. Uh, and so I'm building a team and an operation in um, Nord Anglia um, to attack that problem. And uh, we're keen to work with some of the most innovative players out there um, to, um, to really use Nord Anglia as a test bed for some really innovative approaches. Um, but I'm going to do uh, just finish this presentation by going back to my future learn days and uh, talking a little bit about um, what we were doing in the games industry and what we were kind of learning from uh, the games industry in that period. Um, so um, future learn was we prided ourselves on building um, a platform from scratch uh, that was cross-device um, and um, uh, high-quality, uh, accessible user experience on all of those devices. Um, it, um, uh, we, we pioneered uh, something uh, we called social learning. So every step of every course not only had content for the learner, but that content was intended to be a catalyst for discussion and to provoke conversation, not just between the learner and the educator, but between the learners themselves. And by doing that, we felt and we proved that we could make online learning a much less solitary experience. Um, we could use the power of peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning to encourage people to uh, progress, to continue, 
and to attack problems together. And there's deep learning science that shows that when you learn together, you learn more effectively. And so we effectively built a social network for learning. And by the time I'd left, uh, over 15 million people had signed up to courses uh, and around a third of them had socially engaged in those courses. And those who did, about six times more likely to complete the course. Um, we built up partnerships with um, over 170 universities and educational providers uh, around a quarter of the world's top 200 universities. And increasingly, uh, we started to uh, gravitate towards the games industry and um, training and education uh, in the games industry. So we work with the University of Abate, for example, um, and other leading providers um, in uh, games development. Um, and um, our, our approach was to try and rethink um, traditional qualifications and degrees and unbundle them down to more manageable, flexible modes of learning that could not only help people who couldn't take lives, time out of their lives to attend a university uh, full time, but also people you know, in work who just wanted to get that small snippet of learning rather than uh, devote to a full master's, et cetera. Uh, our first, one of our first eight game uh, courses back in 2013 was this one from the University of Reading. And this was the most successful at that stage. As you can imagine, it had the best title, uh, Build Your First Mobile Game. And um, yeah, over 200,000 people have so far enrolled on this course. Um, and it's still available, I believe, to uh, sign up to. Um, and uh, it was an excellent course to kick us off. Um, but we also started to work with um, a variety of uh, different providers, pulling together um, collections of courses focused on digital skills. And one of the things we were trying to do, and we believe online learning can do, is broaden the talent pool through making learning more, much more accessible. So bringing more women, more people from ethnic minorities into industries and professions that traditionally they have felt excluded from. And um, we did this collaboration with the Institute of Coding, the University of Leeds, on a whole range of uh, digital skills courses. And we saw over 800,000 learners um, sign up to courses. Uh, there are 15 courses on there. They're all free, by the way, uh, and available. And you can see from the reviews that, I mean, they're amazing courses, these. Um, and I highly recommend them if these are areas that would help you enhance your skills to get into the workplace or develop for the workplace. Uh, and uh, we also are confident that by doing this, we were attracting, and we've got proof, a much wider range of people than would traditionally uh, come into um, the digital arena. Um, we also uh, worked with um, University of the Arts, Creative Computing Institute, and the Institute of Coding uh, to create these kind of more snackable um, courses aimed at mid-career professionals that either need, need to pick up a new skill for their current role or help to them to move into a new role. Um, and uh, a two-week overview course, all of these are, so they can get up to speed on the big ideas quickly and then a f uh, four intensive practical courses to try out the tools associated with specific technologies. Um, and we think you know, that there's some areas here that are key for the games industries. And that idea of sort of snackable, flexible uh, learning that can go alongside one's uh, professional development uh, and work, um, we think is you know, a really powerful way of uh, expanding um, uh, the pool of uh, uh, people in an industry. Um, so again, I recommend these to you. Uh, go to futurelearn.com and uh, you should uh, be able to navigate through to these. Um, and then, um, you know, an example uh, of one of those courses is an introduction to indie games, for example, um, and just uh, helping people demystifying and, you know, making less scary the idea of getting into the industry. Uh, but uh, I'll just finish with one where we actually work with uh, Rick and uh, the British Games Institute, uh, National Video Game Museum, 
um, again, uh, trying to encourage people to start their career in games development. Uh, hearing from leading games producers, recruiters, new developers, and um, you know what what I kind of felt as I was working with uh, the BGI, um, and I was starting to hear about you know some of the challenges in the industry that there've been, um, you know, gender, racial equality, many other things. It's kind of um, driving cultural transformation through an industry. Uh, is not something that can be done in small pockets of small people going to small courses, et cetera. I think what we were keen to do, and I, I'd encourage you know you all to think about, is you know really taking mass market approaches to getting people learning together, using social learning as a way of uh, reducing band boundaries, geographic, hierarchical, gender, racial and actually getting people learning together about the big issues in an industry. And, you know, I'm very proud of the work that at FutureLearn we did with BGI and those other players I mentioned. Um, and, you know, I hope that that continues um, for yourselves there. Um, I will remain very closely involved and through Nord Anglia, very keen to continue the innovation um, at the moment through the K-12 sector. Thanks very much. Thank you, Simon, uh, for for that um, really interesting sort of tour of of, of the different things that that FutureLearn offers and that, that you've achieved, and for the um, uh, uh, delightfully shameless plug of what we did with you um, at BGI. Um, so thank you very much for that. So we're about to go into a um, a workshop session. Um, and so that is that's back to back. So we're going to I'm asking you all to close down this window, this webinar. We're going to open up the Zoom meeting in 30 seconds. Look forward to seeing you then. Thanks again, Simon. See everyone soon.